From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on April 4th, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 35th episode of Matters Microbial. Those of you who watch and or listen and spread the microbial word to others, thank you. I truly appreciate folks helping to increase our audience of listeners and viewers. These episodes are great fun for me, and I hope they're informative for others. I continue to be fond of this wonderful 3D-printed, glow-in-the-dark Matters Microbial emblem, recently designed by Dr. Jennifer Quinn as a gift. I need to turn this into a button. As I've mentioned, I sometimes get messages via email about the podcast. Recently, I received a note from Benjamin asking if it's possible for a general interested individual to discover what microbes are in their backyards with molecular techniques. This is generally something that requires a laboratory, but I'm putting a link into the show notes describing people who've done exactly that. And thanks for the question. My intro biology students are continuing their tiny earth journey, looking for bacteria producing antimicrobial compounds from soil, moss, or lichens. They've been screening their isolates against test microbes as seen here. My students went on to test their 16S ribosomal RNA PCR reaction on an agarose gel, as you can see here. We shipped off the purified DNA for sequencing, and soon they'll know the genus level identities of their antibiotic producing buddies. The study of the microbiome is often carried out by analyzing the bacterial DNA to be found in, well, you know. So I make these stool sample jars as a joke from time to time and I've given several away. Speaking of assaying the gut, today's topic deals with a serious disease caused by Clostridium difficile. And yes, the folks at Giant Microbes made a cute plush toy out of it, but it is a serious disease. The disease occurs when the normal ecology of the gut is damaged or changed. Yes, we have whole worlds and ecosystems within us. So, It's a genuine honor to talk about C. difficile and its pathoecology with an expert in the field and a good friend, Dr. Vincent Young of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Welcome to our Quality Quorum today, Vincent. Hey, glad to be here, Mark. Thanks for inviting me today. Oh, it means a lot to me. And who better to talk about this subject? Well, at least you didn't say what you call it, so... Yeah, I was careful. Uh, But the first thing I want everyone to be aware of is sometimes taxonomy changes a little bit over time. So just in case this subject comes up, what I was taught to call Clostridium, that genus level assignment is now being changed to? Clostridioides. But not for all of them, as you know. It is Clostridioides difficile. There are still some Clostridium species around. I know we came. This came up a little bit uh, last week on the podcast, and 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 there was some discussion and frustration that both the guest and myself felt about our own uh, research journeys with this. But we have to be flexible to change. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, technically, it is correct to come up with a good taxonomy based on who is related to who. But sometimes the name changes can be difficult, or in the settings of medical microbiology, can actually be dangerous. You know, this is a very interesting subject because I have a PhD and most of my work was done in environmental microbiology. I was looking at root nodulation bacteria and then bioluminescent bacteria, things of that nature. And I didn't really take but one course in medical microbiology many, many years ago. But you yourself are not simply a PhD, but also an MD. So you are a medical scientist. Not that it makes it any different. We both study microbes and we both study all aspects of microbes, but it's true 
I just came off of two weeks of dealing with microbes, not as something that are very interesting, but as something that we needed to deal with in the hospital and trying to treat patients with infections. And I think this is an important thing because sometimes we get a little distant. Students will often ask me about practical applications, and you know, I can talk and till the cows come home, which is part of Ann Arbor, Michigan nearby, I know, but it's all, but it's really possible to come up with things that are really exciting. But when you get to talk about human disease a little bit, it makes a difference. And that's why I really wanted to talk a little bit about C. diff because it forms this intersection between microbial ecology and for lack of a better term, pathology or, you know, that, or infectious disease in general. So if you don't mind, Vincent, can you give us kind of a thumbnail sketch of, of what C. diff is and the disease that it causes? Sure. Well, let's talk about C. difficile and let's look at this figure, which kind of describes the life cycle, so-called, of C. difficile. Now, as you mentioned, we all have a very complex microbial community that lives in and on us. And it has a lot of different functions. And the one that we're concerned about with regards to C. difficile is this, this thing called colonization resistance. That when you have a stable community, it's resistant to other microbes, be they beneficial or even pathogenic, from coming in and establishing themselves in that community. Well, how can you disturb colonization resistance? For example, one of the ones that I will do as an infectious disease physician is administer antibiotics. I might be treating a pneumonia, but these are broad spectrum and they can affect a lot of other microbes, including the ones in the gut. And that will disrupt this so-called colonization resistance. Now, C. difficile itself is a very interesting organism. It's an obligate anaerobe. It cannot survive trying to grow in the presence of oxygen. But its strategy, as many other anaerobes have, is to produce spores. These are environmentally stable and resistant to things like desiccation. They're resistant to oxygen. And therefore, they can persist in the environment, for example, the hospital environment for a long time. Now, if someone gets exposed to C. difficile spores, if they have a normal gut microbiota, the spores just kind of pass through, nothing happens. But if their microbiota is altered such to the point they don't have colonization resistance, the spores will germinate. There are a number of cues that trigger germination. It's quite interesting, actually. They've learned to detect bile, something that's produced in our gut, as a signal to germinate and not go from the spore state, but go to the vegetative state. Once the vegetative state there is, they start replicating, and eventually they'll produce a very potent toxin. Many of the pathogenic clostridioides and clostridium, they actually produce toxins that affect host functions. In the case of C. difficile, this affects the function of the normal, um, the normal cytoskeleton. And so it actually disrupts the gut quite severely. And that causes the signs and symptoms that we see for C. difficile infection, which is abdominal pain, diarrhea. It can get quite severe. It can actually be fatal. It can cause perforation of the gut and result in sepsis. Now, what do we do once we have this? Once a patient has signs and symptoms of C. difficile, they've been on antibiotics, they develop diarrhea, we can test for it. And if we detect the C. difficile organism and the toxin, then we can treat them with yet more antibiotics, in this case, ones that would actually target the C. difficile itself. And then hopefully, once all the antibiotics are stopped, the C. difficile has been brought down in numbers, the normal microbiota comes back, colonization resistance is restored, and everything goes back to the baseline. One of the interesting things, well, not very interesting for the patients who have this, but about 20% of the time, patients will get better when you treat their C. difficile infection. However, when you stop all antibiotics, you don't have to give them any more antibiotics, they will actually get recurrent disease. They'll become toxin positive, they get diarrhea again. You can treat them once again, but this horrible cycle of recurrent recurrence can go on over and over again and actually can result in quite severe illness in the patients and again can lead to death. And why does that happen? Well, it's thought that for whatever reason, the microbiota cannot restore colonization resistance. Perhaps it's been so altered by antibiotics. Even when you stop antibiotics, the microbes that are left cannot actually 
interfere with C. difficile, which is why we've gotten to the point that we can try to try to restore the normal microbiota. And the one that most people have heard about is we can give something like fecal transplantation to restore a normal microbiota, restore colonization resistance, and help the patients recover. This is really interesting to me for a variety of reasons, Vincent. My own teaching, we used to use this term, please don't cringe, niche exclusion. The idea being that there's something about the community in the gut that is able to be resistant. And I often talk about this when you burn down a forest, the first thing that grows back are the weeds. Right. And I'm not being negative, but this, this, you know, they have an opportunity to grow. And that was the simplistic view that I had. But the more I learn about interactions that take place among the microbes of the gut, I'm wondering if there's almost a more systems level to it. That's very much true. I mentioned the bile acids. I mentioned the bile acids that we produce. We use them to help digest fats. Well, that's very interesting. C. difficile has learned to figure out that it's in the gut. Oh, wait, here's something that's only produced in the gut to digest fats. I must be in a good place. I'm going to try to germinate. But it gets even more complicated than that. So the bile acids that they detect are ones that are conjugated. We conjugate them in our liver to amino acids like glycine or taurine. However, there are other microbes in the gut that will remove those amino acids. And then other ones yet that will even remove hydroxyl groups and can actually produce bile acids that are toxic to C. difficile and can actually, can actually inactivate the C. difficile toxins. So when you disrupt this very, very complicated system, you can get, in the terms of systems biology, emergent properties that you wouldn't predict by trying to study individual parts on their own. Oh, I think this is just absolutely, I mean, it, it, to me, if you think about a rainforest and the diversity of a rainforest, we have a lot more diversity than that within our very gut. And we tend to dismiss it or over humorize it because we're really talking about poop, right? Yeah. But not really. I mean, we're talking about 10 to the 12th or 10 to the 13th microbes per cubic centimeter in there. It's not a surprise that they've learned to you know, have associations both positive and negative. And there's very probably a preferred community. I didn't say one, but a preferred community. And, and so this invader has to find a way around it. So it has to sig find a signal that it's in the right place. And I wonder if it's also listening to see who else other types of microbes are there. That's probably true. You know, there are signals and cues that microbes get from the host and the rest of their environment. And in some place like the gut, that ecosystem, it's other microbes as well that they have to listen to. You know, it's, it's interesting, Vincent, and I just want to say parenthetically to the listeners and the viewers, you sent us three publications from your research group, and I'm going to put them in the show notes. And what is amazing is not simply the wonderful figures, one of which you just went over, but I believe in, in your first uh, article, Viewing Bacterial Colonization Through the Lens of Systems Biology, you have a wonderful section called Key Points that is just excellent for any level of micronaut that's currently listening or watching this show. And this is a rare thing. It's, it's very easy to shoot above or shoot below. But the fact is, all kinds of people are listening, and I think it's important to be challenged. I found your papers actually really accessible. So thank you. Thanks. They are reviews and they're written, at least two of them are written by my recent graduate students. And the one that you just referred to, she actually is very much excited about science communication to the point that she's actually working for the American Society for Microbiology in their communications huh. department. So she actually has a great blog. We can post that in the show notes as well, because she actually posts a lot of very accessible articles about all aspects of microbiology. So I, I love this idea where you're talking about this resistance, I, this resistance to colonization. And it, it's kind of uh, kind of takes us to your second paper, and your second paper that you talked about with us a little bit is capturing the environment of the clostroid <laughs> clostridioides uh, clostridioides um, difficile infection cycle. <laughs> uh, make all the fun you want. C I'm doing pretty well for a Long Beach boy. We're good with that. Yeah. 
Okay. Anyway, that's a lovely one that talks about the complexities of the environment. And I, I think the interesting thing for me is I, as I read these papers or when I listen to you or when I talk to you is that it's one thing to talk about what these bacteria look like on a plate, how they're modal, what they sense, the fact that they can't tolerate oxygen. But this has a human component that makes it very compelling. And I don't know, soft-hearted as I am, that I could, I could do work in that area, to be honest with you. I mean, I, 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 I like to study bacteria that eat other bacteria, so that's fine by me. So uh, there you go. It's quite interesting to think about all of these adaptations that C. difficile seems to have to cause, quote unquote, cause antibiotic associated diarrhea. If you think about it, the antibiotic age is barely a century old, and these microbes have been around for a very long time. You know, we weren't concentrating antibiotics to millions of times higher concentration that would ever be encountered in the environment. So why does C. difficile and these other pathogenic clostridioides, why do they have these toxins that target things like our actin cytoskeleton? Why do they target, the, you know, why do they have neurotoxins like C. botulinum? Why do they have all of these other toxins? They must have some sort of adaptive, evolutionarily conserved function. And I'm not sure what that is. Now, getting directly to your question, C. difficile infection being in a clinical infection, it can happen in a variety of different mammals. It's been known to cause diarrhea in dogs and cats. It can cause a horrible colitis in, in race horses. So oh. it can affect a number of different mammals. But at the same time, you can find it in other mammals, including humans, asymptomatically. And that balance mm. of what causes disease, what leads to asymptomatic colonization, is something that we're very interested in. I think I sent you one other paper where we were looking at the colonization of patients in a medical intensive care unit. We actually found a lot of people from which you could isolate C. difficile who didn't have any signs of infection. That is good for the individual patient, but also does that have things that might portend problems for the ICU community at large? You know, if there's that much undetected carriage, what should we be doing? Should we be screening everyone and preemptively treating? That doesn't sound like something that we can do and actually could cause more problems because the only way we know to eliminate C. difficile right now is to give antibiotics. And we know that's what gets us in into problems in the first place, not just with C. difficile, not just with disruption of the microbiota, but of course, the problems of antibiotic resistance. Do you have any knowledge of, of the the Oh, I'm looking for a word. The the bio burden of, of when when you have a symptomatic person with C diff versus an asymptomatic one. Because on a simplistic level, we could always just talk about cell number. But this is something surely that's been studied. It's been sort of looked at. Um, this is where you get into this whole idea of systems biology. You can find in classic one or infants. You can find infants who carry toxigenic C. difficile that is producing toxin. You can detect the toxin. It's bioactive in their gut, and the kids are asymptomatic. Now, why is that? And I remember in the dark ages, back when I was a medical student, and I heard about C. difficile, and they were so excited because, oh, it's just been less than 10 years since we fulfilled Coke's, Coke's postulates, postulates for C. difficile as the cause of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And then they would talk about how do you can find it in infants and they're asymptomatic. And I asked the exact same question, why? And they said, well, it must be obvious because they don't have the receptor for the toxin. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, we don't know, but don't, you're bothering me. Let's go on to other things. You know, I mean, it was kind of amazing how little we knew and actually, it's only very recently that we have a better understanding about what receptors might be there in various populations. We're beginning to understand how microbes can mediate colonization resistance. But this is 40 plus years on, and we're still asking some pretty basic questions about this organism.
One of the things that I think is intriguing to a lot of people, people, including me, is this business of asymptomatic colonization that takes place and the ideas of what can possibly limit it. And the problem as I ponder it is I'm thinking it could be almost anything or a combination. Similar to when students ask me, is, is is something A, B, or C? And I'll say yes. And that's what my fear your answer will be here. Is it the host response? Is it the other microbes surrounding it, or is it something about C. diff itself that is, is, is kind of modulating what it does to match the environment? And you know the answer, yes. And again, it comes back to this idea of systems biology. What determines the emergent properties of the system? It's the interaction between all the parts. And we are trying to figure that out because you can see a patient who is you know, in their feces, you can detect fairly high levels of bioactive C. difficile toxin, and they don't have diarrhea. There's nothing going on. Now, why is that? Is it something about their genetics? Is it something about their microbiota? Is it something about their baseline inflammatory process that's going on? These are all probably contributing to when does a patient, just because you have C. difficile, when do they actually have disease versus not? I think this is really interesting to me because um, I've, I've often read that if you just do a skin swab on individuals, you get a certain percentage of people with detectable, with detectable levels of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, but they're, they don't have any symptomology. Um, and then you, you, you ask yourself, what makes the difference? And all I can kind of cling to v- very much like Leonardo DiCaprio did in Titanic is this idea that was explained to me a little bit by Arturo Casadevall, that it's really contextual. And, and the example he uses with me is, is, is we have a version of E. coli in our gut that makes vitamins, and that's a good thing for us. But if we have some tragic accident that spills the, the gut contents into the protoneal cavity, then I could have sepsis and die. So it's all context, context, context in the way that a real estate agent says location, location, location. And I wonder if that is part of it. Uh, and, and how do you tease that out? I was just the other day talking on another podcast about a three-member microbial system that's extraordinarily complex. Now, what if we have thousands of things interacting with one another? How can we figure out what's going on in this case, other than by observation? We certainly can't do standard. Uh, well, I guess you can do some experimentation to look into this. Yeah, and that's where the whole idea of systems biology comes in, though. And if you're into things like chaos theory, I'm by no means a mathematician that's into chaos theory. But slight perturbations in initial parameters on any given system can result in widely different outcomes after t- after a certain amount of time. But I think that's where, as scientists, we have to be very careful. We are always talked about how, you know, we're always taught, you have to be very careful and control your experiments. But if you control too many things, what we have found in the past is that you can come up with a statistically significant result, like, oh, if we constrain all of this and we change this, this happens. But then if we try to move more towards real life and we allow one other thing to vary that's very important, all of a sudden that very statistical difference doesn't make any biological difference at all. So it's not to throw up your hands and say, oh, we can't do reductionist scientists reductionist science. But we have to be very careful to try to put whatever results we obtain in the laboratory into context, which is why with regards to C. difficile, I study it in the lab, we study it in animal models, we study it in organoids, we study it in bioreactors. But as a physician scientist, I also want to understand what's happening at the level of the patient, an intensive care unit or a health system and move up and down in the scale to see which are the important factors at all different levels of studying this problem. No, I think that this is a topic that will interest many people. And and, and Vincent, I'm really counting on you uh, after the podcast to send me some links where people can learn more.
because I, I think that this, not mirror image, but this, this different viewpoint, I do want to talk to you about how you do experiments with C. diff, et cetera, but I think it's important. I mean, and I can go looking for them, but I'll bet since you get these questions a lot, you'll have some wonderful sources for our listeners and viewers. So my first question is how you, you must grow it under anaerobic conditions and, and what kind of media does it grow on? It is true. You know, we grow the C. difficile in anaerobic chambers of which we have mm -hmm. on the two floors in our lab between the different labs that we have. We have about a dozen of them and not all of them are purely anaerobic. We study some other microbes that do best at say two to 5% oxygen, but you're right. Mm -hmm. C. difficile will only grow well in the total absence of oxygen and it grows on a relatively simple media. We can grow it on brain heart infusion. Yeah, it's still complex. It's yeah. not a defined media, but it's not like you have to add a whole bunch of things to get it to grow. Really what you have to do is you just have to get rid of the oxygen and it'll go, it'll grow yeah. quite well. And and prior in a, in a prior prior uh, episode, we talked a little bit about anaerobic chambers and and they're like glove boxes that people have probably seen. Or, or, or watched bad sci-fi movies about, but the simple fact of the matter it what's well, right, right is it's kind of it's it's a challenge because you 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 can't physically touch these things when you're working with them, but you it's it's just the way it's done because of the conditions the organism grows best in. Uh, I know that there are lots of very fastidious organisms that live within us. It's good that C. diff can grow on something more standard. And, and, and then you can carry out the same kinds of experiments that any other microbiologist would do, except it's in an anaerobic chamber. But you did mention a little bit about animal models and you mentioned organoids. And I thought, you are you using mice for your animal models? Yes, we've used mice. Um, Koch's postulates itself was fulfilled in hamsters. I've never used the hamster model, but in all cases, what you need to do is you need to give a little bit of antibiotics. So it mir mirrors the, what we see in people. You give them a dose or multiple doses of antibiotics, and then you challenge them with the spores of C. difficile, and the spores will germinate. And that's how we've understood a lot about the germination of the spores and what how other microbes can interfere by further modifying the bile acids into things that are toxic. But basically, we can give as few as 20 spores. And if you have a highly virulent strain of C. difficile and a very susceptible animal, it will actually cause quite severe disease quickly. And then organoids are, are you using stem cells when you make them? We have used uh, both um, ones that are derived from the, so, the so-called enteroids that are epithelium only that are from biopsies. But we've also used the stem cell derived ones that actually have epithelium and uh, mesenchyma around it. In fact, our first study in C. difficile was based on that. And we showed that the C. difficile will grow within the organoid. And after a while, once it gets stressed, it seems like stress is related to both sporulation and toxin production. It'll produce toxin mm. and cause damage to the epithelium of the organoid. And this is damaging the cytoskeleton. And it is through cytoskeletal yeah, is, damage. Yeah. Yeah, this is fascinating. And, you know, I wanted to tell the listeners and viewers that this idea of sensing things, you mentioned again bile acid, this is something that's a really big deal among pathogenic microbes. I mean, Corine bacterium diphtheriae is like smelling iron. And if, it's, if there's a lot of available iron, then it means it's time to turn on toxin genes. And it's the same kind of thing that you're talking about. How do you know where you are? And, it, as, you, and as you've already mentioned, Vincent, if there's one signal that an organism can use, there are other organisms that can interfere with that signal, which is just fascinating. What I like is that you've done work in culture. You've done work in an animal system, and you've done work in these organoids, which are kind of bridging the gap between those two. So I think you've, you, you have a pretty good series of systems to study what this organism is doing. And uh, I, I think it's a wonderful system to look at. I understand it doesn't smell good, but then again, few microbes do, right? Right. 
So this is something that I think is, is really interesting. You've, you found out a lot about what's going on. I looked at some of the figures that you've put together in your, in your publications, and I really like um, a couple of the figures you've had in particular, and it's about how to control what's taking place with C. diff a little bit. And, you know, one would say, well, you know, environmental decontamination is one of them. And then there's the issue of dealing with bile acids and, and, and all the rest. And then we come to this idea, and I think we should spend a couple of minutes on it if it's all right with you, the idea of fecal transplants, because not only is it fodder for jokes, because there's nothing better than poop humor, I understand that. But on the other hand, there was a time when this was thought to be a really important therapy for this disorder. Well, it is still actually an important therapy for patients, in particular, those who have recurrent disease. Um, the FDA has recently, in the last two years, has approved two different products that are derived from donated human feces that is processed mm -hmm. in a kind of a standardized manner to make it safer, to kind of screen for pathogens. To be, that are to be used for treating patients with recurrent C. difficile infection. And so the way that this is generally administered, um, and I know there, there have been a, a, like the simple way from, you know, where as a, essentially, I would call it backward lavage, but what do you call it? Well, it's technically an enema. So the first one that was approved is administered via an enema. It's basically, again screened and processed feces that's packaged right. and frozen in a plastic bag with a delivery system so that it can be delivered via enema. So that's from, as we could, rather than just saying backwards, we often say from below, if we want to say it that way, as opposed to from above, which can be put through a nasogastric tube or the other one that's approved, it's actually encapsulated, purified spores from donated feces that is swallowed. So it's not the whole community in that, is it? It's, it's just a portion of that community. Right, and it's interesting being a microbiologist. I was talking with, and this is nothing against my gastroenterology colleagues who also treat recurrent C. difficile and are interested in conditions like inflammatory bowel diseases. Right. But I brought up to them, they were saying like, yeah, we're trying to follow the protocols that you guys have used for recurrent C. difficile infection to see if fecal transplant can treat a variety of other diseases. And I say, oh, is it okay that you kill greater than 99% of what's in the feces? And they look at me and they say, what are you talking about? Well, I said, if you look at the original descriptions of using fecal transplants, you take a wearing blender and you take sterile water or sterile saline. Always wondered why it had to be sterile, given what you're about to do to it. And then you put feces in it and you make sure that the lid is on and you turn it on high, whip it on up. And then generally it was administered via an enema. Now we brought up the whole idea of anaerobic chambers. This is basically done on the bench top with fluids that have equilibrated with ambient oxygen, have 21% oxygen right. in it, which is going to kill most of the organisms that are present in feces because they are obligate anaerobes. The only ones that are survive are the facultative anaerobes and E. coli, which is not something, you, as you pointed out, not necessarily something that you want to bring into some particularly a debilitated patient. But mm. fortunately for treating recurrent C. difficile, the spore formers, which will survive such treatment, it's within that spore forming fraction that this mm -hmm. magical colonization resistance seems to reside. That's interesting. So it's just a subset of what's there. And, 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 and that's not really a surprise. I mean, if, if, if there was, I'm trying to come up with a rainforest analogy, but it's when you think about administering a rainforest as an enema kind of goes away. I'm not trying to, to make, make light of it at all. But it's interesting because we're, the, the thought that we have is we're trying to replace an ecology and that ecology is able to therefore diminish the ability of C. diff to colonize. And, and, and that sticks in my mind okay. 
But it turns out it's just a few members of that. And I, I don't have the slightest idea of how you would tease out. And it might not be something that's teasable. It might be interactions between a few members that are necessary. Right. So the next that's generation, really I, I think I sent you the review talking about microbiome therapeutics in general. And people are trying to become a little bit more refined, starting with feces, starting with fractions of feces. But the next logical step would be, okay, can we figure out precisely the organisms that may be sufficient for certain conditions? Can we grow them in the lab? Can we then combine them under good manufacturing practice so that what you're doing is you're delivering the same thing over and over again? Even these FDA approved products, every single lot is going to be different because they came from a different donated fecal, you know, fecal yeah. specimen. And from day to day, a person's fecal specimen is not going to be exactly the same, depending on what they ate, depending on all sorts of things. Sure, from day to day, it's going to be more similar than another person, but they don't only have one donor as well. So this is why we are trying to move to the point of understanding things to the point that we can figure out what a person needs and give precisely that in the form of some sort of microbiome therapeutic, as it's referred to. You were talking about the processing that takes place. It's made from many donors, et cetera. Have there been examples of where people, and I, I hate to use this term, bank their own fecal samples off the off chance that they can then uh, get treated by their own community? You know, it's interesting that you say that. I started my career at Michigan State University, and that's where I learned microbial ecology. And I was talking with a postdoc there, and this is over 20 years ago now, or roughly 20 years ago. And I said, hey, you know what? We can make a lot of money. You know how they can bank cord blood? You know, what they do is they take, you know, when a child is delivered, they take a sample of, the, of blood from the umbilical cord and freeze it because it contains stem cells. And the idea was that if a child subsequently needed a stem cell transplant, suppose they were six years old and they developed leukemia, mm -hmm. you could then give them back their own stem cells and you don't have to worry about it being quote unquote allergenic. It's an auto, it's an, you know, autogenic, same exact genes and therefore you don't have to worry about all these side effects. I said we could do the same thing with feces. We could start up a fecal bank, have people give us one or more samples of their feces, and we'll do the same thing. We'll charge you a certain amount to process it and store it. And then every year you'll get something in the mail that'll say, hey, do you still want to have your feces banked for just in case you get recurrency difficile? Or if we find out another reason that you might want to have a, you know, a fecal transplant. And my postdoc said, that's kind of crazy. You think that would work? I said, well, I don't know. If you want to do it, maybe we could do it. I guess if we had done it 20 years ago, we would be, you know, looking okay right now. That being said, there are no commercial entities that do that. But there is a study. My colleagues, um, Eric Pamer is at the University of Chicago. He used to be at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and he had a very talented ID, junior ID faculty member there, Ying Tar. And what they were doing is they were looking at patients who were going to get bone marrow transplants. And what they were doing is they were wondering if they also took the patient's feces before they had all the uh. antibiotics and before they had all of the conditioning regimen that was needed for their bone marrow transplant. Could they bank their feces in case they got C. difficile? And the other thing is they had done a lot of studies that shows that the microbiota is related to susceptibility to this basically side effect of bone marrow transplant called graft versus host disease. And they have an ongoing study where they're automatically giving back the feces to try to limit the graft versus host disease. So it has been done, but not at a very large scale. Well, I I, it, I think that's an interesting way to look at things, and I'm I'm keeping myself from the obvious joke that it's a crappy idea, right? That's what you're waiting yep. for. 
And you know, again, I, I know that I'm 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 preaching to the microbial choir a little bit on this, but it's very easy to focus on the fecal aspect of this. But again, we come back to the gut contents having 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 13th organisms per cubic centimeter. It shouldn't be a surprise. It's this enormous bustling metropolis of microbes. And, you know, the only way that we are able to analyze what's in there essentially or, or more easily, there are other ways if you just had one patient maybe, is by looking at what comes out. And that's what we're looking at. And so it, I guess you have to get past that if you work in that field. But it's such a complex community. And, I, you know, to me, it's like I'm going to study a rainforest. Where do you start? And what you've done is you've said, here's something where we know there's an effect in the rainforest, for lack of a better term, with an with some kind of invasive organism. And that is a great place to start. I, I think it would teach us so much about so many aspects of human health because, I mean, the gut is essentially just about the largest organ in the body in terms of surface area. And we've got so many microbes there. It's not a surprise that it's like the barrier between us and the world. And these organisms are part of it. Yep. It is a symbiosis has been probably been yeah. brought up so, so many times, right? Yeah. And, you know, you've heard and you. I'm sorry you've had to hear this from me, but, you know, I talk a lot. I, I um, often say that there are organisms that have co-evolved with us. There are some that shouldn't be there that gain a foothold. And there's a third group that are just passing through. And that's because we're essentially tubes, right? right? <laughs> Goes in one end and comes out the other. But this idea of what the co-adapted organisms are is really important because they're not in business necessarily for us. They're in business with each other. That's the thing I find so fascinating. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that last paper of yours and it's the one about hospital stuff. And it does deal with this issue of asymptomatic uh, cases as well. And this is from Nature Medicine. And it's a lovely, lovely publication, Longitudinal Genomic Surveillance of Carriage and Transmission of C. diff in an Intensive Care Unit. I'm used to things on Petri dishes. This is the real world. Yeah, that was actually a very fun paper to write, obviously, and to do it because my career has sort of been defined by the fact that I love working as part of teams. And if you look at the authors on that paper, they run the gamut of expertise from infection preventionists, infectious disease physicians, genomicists, basic microbiologists, uh, you know, microbiologists, epidemiologists, all kind of bringing their expertise to work on a very complicated problem. So this was done at uh, by my colleagues at Rush University, and uh, they have what's known as a CDC epicenter, a prevention epicenter that's meant to study and try to figure out how do we prevent these healthcare-associated infections, specifically for this particular project. And one of the things that they've been very good at doing, my colleague, uh, it's led by Mary Hayden, who's the director of infectious disease and the clinical microbiology lab at Rush. And they've been very good at conducting these massive epidemiologic studies. And what they did is they said, okay, we need to get good data. Let's take every single patient who comes into the intensive care unit at Rush and try to sample them every single day doing surveillance for a whole variety of healthcare associated infections. And they're looking at the usual suspects. You already brought up MRSA, um, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, resistant enterobacteriales, such as resistant E. coli and uh, resistant Klebsiella. And as we were designing the study, I was saying like, oh, wait a minute, we could add C. difficile in here pretty quickly. And that's what we did. We got an extra sample that we could bring back to the lab. And we had basically 3,000 patients who were sampled on average daily while they were in the intensive care unit. And we used our enrichment culture techniques, which are the most sensitive techniques that we have, to try to grow out C. difficile. And we actually found a fair amount of it 
But in that whole year, there were very few cases of actual symptomatic C. difficile infection. What we saw instead is that a lot of people can carry C. difficile. They can bring it into the intensive care unit. And if they do bring it in, those are the patients that are at much higher risk of actually getting C. difficile infection. Yeah. The interesting finding is that we were expecting to find a lot of cross-transmission from one patient to the other because we're doing full genome sequencing, you know, draft genomes, and trying to look to see if, oh, this patient gave it to this patient who gave it to that patient. We saw very few instances of where there was transmission, and that was not in the patients who actually developed the symptomatic disease. And so we don't even know for sure that it was passed, but the genomic data was consistent with that. So when we were getting the paper reviewed, they said, well, of course you didn't see a lot of cross-transmission because this group does a lot of infection prevention technique. Like they use sporicidal agents to clean the room every single day. The patients are in single room. That's not something that can be done all the time. And we said, well, but wait a minute. This intensive care unit does do it all the time. So there are things that we can do to try to limit transmission. And they seem to be doing a good job. So now the next thing that we got is we have to figure out, okay, if we identified a patient who is carrying C. difficile, how do we block that transition from carriage to actual symptomatic disease? So there was a lot of stuff in that paper that was kind of interesting. It's caused a lot of conversation. Some people are saying, are you sure? And he says, well, no, but you guys can look as well and see if it's the exact same thing that you're seeing, or are you finding different things about the transmission and tra uh, transition from colonization to actual frank infection and disease. So Vincent, when we talk about contracting C. diff infections, that's kind of interesting where it comes from. And I'm curious, is it coming from the environment or, or, or some other type of uh, transit? And the other thing related to it, is there anything that you can do to kind of reduce that? I know they do that in hospitals, perhaps an alcohol-based gel, something like that. Yeah, that's actually an excellent question. Um, I mentioned that the spore is the infective form of the organism. Um, and the spores can be found on surfaces. You can do studies. You can basically look at high touch surfaces, bed rails, doorknobs, light switches, and you can find viable C. difficile spores. You put them on a plate that carries the germinant and they'll start growing. Now, that's one thing. The other important thing is that the spores, as I said, are environmentally resistant. They're resistant to oxygen, of mm -hmm. course, important for an anaerobe. They're also resistant to desiccation. So therefore, they're actually resistant to the activities of alcohol hand rubs. So if you go into the hospital and you see a patient's room where the patient inside has C. difficile, there will be a special sign on the door that say, do not use alcohol mm -hmm. hand rubs to go in or out. In fact, some hospitals, they will actually remove the alcohol dispensers so that you are forced to wash your hands, to actually physically remove the spores from your hands, to not spread it. Soap and water. Mm -hmm. Soap and water. I was going to say is, and I indeed saw signs like that in the ward where my brother was before he passed. Right. You know, because you have to wash your hands. The other thing about that is it depends on what kinds of uh, solutions are used to decontaminate surfaces every day. Now, bleach is a very good sporicidal, but if you're using bleach on stainless steel and on all sorts of things throughout a hospital every day, that'll destroy things. And it's also not great for the environmental health folks. It's not great for the patients. There are specific sporicides that can be used. And um, they are being used, for example, in our study in the intensive care unit, a sporicide was used every day, and not just the standard quaternary ammonium, which can reduce spores somewhat, but not as effective as something that's designed to be a sporicide itself. You know, for the listeners and viewers, if you're not familiar with spores, I mean, the cross section of them shows layer after layer of protection. It's just amazing. Yeah, they're and, quite and beautiful. After you see that, and, and after you see that, you're not surprised that they're so resistant to what you want to do. 
Well, this is very interesting to me because as I say, I like to think of us as being rolled in a whole bunch of microbes. We're swimming in microbes. And so if we're just looking at what's there, we might be able to find all kinds of crazy things. I I have a student, you know, we, we look at what's in their water bottles and we got a Neisseria out of them. And no, that doesn't mean Neisseria gonorrhea. There are plenty of nasopharyngeal um, types of Neisseria out there. But, you know, those are looking at individual things as opposed to like putting them in context with what else is there. Right. And that's, and that's interesting to me. We we are really ecologies walking around. And then when you're in one place and you're in a hospital, what happens to that ecology is an interesting one. And if I heard you correctly, you're suggesting there's not a lot of evidence of transmission within this setting. It's within kind of the ICU in. setting, though. But see, that's the thing. Got it. And, and that's... Mm -hmm. As opposed to on a general ward, depending on the hospital, you might have two patients in one room or you might have private rooms or not. People go to many places in a hospital. You know, you're not just sitting in your room. You're going to various places for tests. You might be going to a dialysis center. And I think the important thing to know is depending on how much healthcare exposure that depends on when you look at those populations, how much C. difficile can you detect asymptomatically? We and others right. have done studies of people who don't have a lot of contact with the medical, you know, they're otherwise healthy. In other words, they go see their doctor, but they haven't been in long-term care facilities and not been hospitalized a lot. They don't go to dialysis or infusion centers. In those settings, most people find less than... Two to three percent of people will have cult cultivatable C. difficile. If you go to a general hospital ward, though, that might go up to 15, 20 percent. And are these transient colonizations? Because that's one of the things that we saw in that paper. On any given day, you might detect patients where you, you sample them 10 times, and one time you were able to pick up C. difficile. What happened there? Did they just happen to ingest some and it just some spores and they passed straight through? Unclear. There are other patients who we can get multiple strains of C. difficile out over continued time. So that's a patient who probably is asymptomatically colonized as opposed to just having it pass through transiently. So there's everything in between as well. And, and, and as, we, as I've been saying repeatedly, this isn't necessarily a surprise. We're reductionist by nature. And we tend to think of looking at like one cell versus another cell, but that's not what's going on here. So you, I imagine you could get like a transient situation where there was an attempt at colonization and then perhaps the surrounding microbes respond to that by inhibiting that process. Yep. I didn't say that's what happened, but it, it could be. But we can and, do that and, in and our animal models. So for example, if we take a non-antibiotic treated mouse and you give them a bunch of spores, you'll detect viable C. difficile the next day in their feces. But if you go back three, four, five days, you don't find it because all it did was pass through. It didn't establish and replicate and continue right. shedding. So it's been denied. It's been right? denied. That's, it's yeah, been resisted. That's... Colonization <laughs> has been resisted. And that's a really, I mean, I really, I, I, I was never interested in, in medicine because I'm so thumb fingered and I would hate to make a mistake. But what I like about what you're doing here is you're able to take, and this is why the title, you know, from the bench to the, 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 the bed and back again is really relevant because this is the way that you're looking at things. Uh, and I, I don't have that opportunity, but I'll bet a lot of people are interested in hearing about this kind of interesting medical lifestyle that you've been you've been sharing so because you do both things you do research and you see patients yep where's your free time um in between how's that um <laughs> you know i think the way to do it is for me i've had to choose i'm not as my research is not as broad as a microbiologist who doesn't see patients. My clinical interests are not necessarily as broad as a an infectious disease physician who's an infectious disease physician most of the time. However, I've picked and choose areas that when I overlap, I still go to the same depth. 
So, you know, and I, I like to look at the intersections. That's why I'm studying healthcare associated infections. That's why my clinical practice is in the hospital, not in the outpatient setting, because I study infections that occur in hospitalized patients. So I restrict my clinical activity to those hospitalized patients. Now, do I miss having a uh, you know a clinic? I had a clinic for a couple of years. It was it was a lot of fun, but I realized I do need time to actually rest. So I had to pick and choose what I do on both in both areas, both my research and my clinical practice. I think that's a really interesting subject. I don't know that a lot of I, I know a lot of students that are interested in this idea of being a medical scientist. And I've been fortunate enough to know a few people that have both MDs and PhDs and thread that needle. And you're one of them. And I think it's a wonderful story to hear. Normally, Vincent, I like to ask about what really motivated someone to do microbiology. But I have a different question for you, and I know it's one that's close to your heart. You had a very influential mentor at Stanford, and I actually got to attend a couple of his classes. And I thought you might want to talk about him a little bit. Yeah, we were there at the same time, Mark. We never met each other then, or maybe we were in the same audience at one point, but we didn't actually know each other then. And I was, a, I was an unevolved soul, soul trust me. I, you know... As befits me becoming a MD PhD, I had two mentors for my thesis work. One was a physician, Gary Skulnick. He actually studied gonococcus initially and then started studying enteric bacteria. And then the other person who you're probably referring to is Stanley Falco, sort of the father of bacterial pathogenesis. I know some people will take, you know, take issue with that characterization, but there are a number of people who have referred to him that way. And um, in fact, Stanley is probably who I first heard about C. difficile infection about during my first year of medical school when I was taking the basic microbiology course. He would often talk about C. difficile and all sorts of other enteric diseases. So he definitely was an inspiration to me. Both of them were because Gary is an infectious disease physician. Stanley is a brilliant scientist, and I kind of took the lessons that I gained from both of them and ended up merging them together into my career. It's funny to me because I, I knew Stan a little bit, and, and he was just the nicest person as well as a fine scientist. And, and we won't name names, but we knew associated people that weren't such nice people, you and I both. Yeah. And there's no reason to name names on that. But the people who really do reach out and are kind to others the way Stan was, plus he told jokes that were really bad. And, and that always makes a friend. That always make, And you know the jokes I'm talking about. I won't talk about them here. They're disease-related jokes. There's nothing like awful. They're just inappropriate for this podcast. But it was just so shocking to hear him because I would go to his I would go to the med the med student uh classes to hear him to, to he hear was him. fantastic. Yeah. Uh and and I I don't blame you for being very inspired by him. But at, at the same time there's a lot of serendipity. There there could have been you know it, interestingly enough the reason that I was hooked up with Stan and Gary was not through me trying to contact them because I did but they were very busy and this is in the pre-email stages when I would kind of like leave notes and leave it with their administrative assistant and see if they would actually get back to me, which didn't happen. So even even easier to ignore some hand scrawled note than it is to ignore an email, perhaps. But it was another MD PhD, Lucy Tompkins, who was the one that actually put me in touch with both of them. Um, if I can do a little bit of an aside, I would always be walking down on Fridays to go down to the ATM to pick up a little bit of cash for the weekend. And I would be walking down this long corridor in the Stanford Hospital, and I would always walk by a door that said Lucy Tompkins, MD, PhD. And I knew who she was, and she had lectured a couple of times. And I was having a hard time finding a lab to join. And one Friday, as I was walking down, I saw that her door was ajar, so I just knocked on the door. And you're talking about nice people. Lucy's one of the nicest people you will ever meet. 
And I said, Professor Tompkins, can I talk with you? I'm one of the first year medical students. I'm an MD, PhD student. She goes, sure, come on in. And we chatted for a while. And he goes, you know, what are you interested in? He goes, well, I see that you're an MD, PhD, and I'm feeling a little bit lost because I'm trying to find a lab to join. And I'm not exactly sure how to figure out what it is that I want to do. She talked to me for a little bit. She found out what my undergraduate research was all about, my, what my interests were. And she goes, you know, I really think you should be doing microbiology. And yes, I'm an infectious disease physician, but my microbiology is not probably what you need for your, for your PhD. But perhaps you should talk to someone like Gary Skulnick or Stanley Falco. And I said, oh, I've contacted them. And I said, yeah, but they haven't, you know, gotten back to me. And she goes, well, just a second. So she picks up her phone and she dials and she goes, Stanley, honey, I have a very nice medical student who I'm going to send to you now. So before we go to dinner tonight, I need you to talk to this young man. And, uh, you know, the rest they say is history. But if it wasn't for Lucy, A, being nice enough to you know, answer the door and not say, oh, I'm sorry, it's five o'clock on a Friday. I'm going to be going out to dinner soon. She talked to me, found out what I wanted and set, set me up and set me along a path that I'm on to this day. So. What, what I like about that is I'm wearing a pin that says science is for everyone. And, and it's really true. And one of the things that people think is that scientists are super exclusionary. And there are some that are like that. But the majority of scientists that I've been fortunate enough to interact with have always, well, you're a good example, have been willing to spend time with me and chat with me and come up with ideas. And it it really does help to have people like that around. And all you can do, and it's what I've tried to do with my own students, is pay that kindness forward. So with that, Thank you very much for your time. My very best wishes. And I can't, I, I can't wait to hear stories about your kids because they're now all grown up. Thanks again, Vincent. All right. Thanks again for the invitation, Mark. This has been a lot of fun. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with some lovely links as always, can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Vincent Young is in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Many, many thanks as always to David Renata for superb editing and Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope that you've enjoyed being part of our quality quorum for today. See you next time on Matters Microbial. Microbial.